Well, good morning, everybody. Great to see you. Welcome to Heartland. If we've not had the chance to meet, my name's Nick. I'm one of our pastors, and it's such a privilege to get to open God's Word with you today. We're going to be in John chapter 14, if you brought a Bible with you. If you'd like the notes for today, you can just text the word notes to 68,000. It's our short code here at Heartland. You can see all the notes from everything we're going to talk about today. But I'm excited to jump back into this. Since the beginning of the year, we've been in a series called Abide in Me, where we've been looking at the last sermon Jesus ever gave to his disciples around a dinner table. And all throughout this sermon, I hope we've had a chance to go back and read this to know where we're going. Jesus is giving his disciples little glimpses and foreshadowing into what's going to happen. So he starts speaking to them and he's saying, hey, listen, uh, Where I'm going, you can't follow. It's good that I go. And what he's doing is he's letting them in on the secret that I have come to the moment where I'm going to fulfill the mission of why I've come. So we celebrated that mission last week, that I've come not to just be a teacher or a moral example or do some good things. I came to be the savior of the world. Like I came to die for the sins so that you could have direct access to the throne of God. One of those places where Jesus is giving a picture is in John chapter uh, 13, 33, when he says, my children, I'll be with you only a little longer. Like you're going to look for me. And just as I told the Jews and everybody else, I tell you now where I'm going, you cannot come. But Jesus would say to them later, he'd say, it's so good that I'm going. Not just to fulfill the mission that I'm going to go and I'm going to lay down my life and I'll be resurrected so that you could experience that same resurrection in your life. It's good because when I go, not only will you have access to the throne of God, but God is going to live and breathe and work in your life. You'll not only have access to him, but look what he says in John 14. He's talking to his disciples and he says this, if you love me, keep my commands and I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate to help you, to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. Jesus starts giving insight to when I'm gone, listen, the separation between you and God will also be gone and the same spirit that raised me from the dead is going to be able to work and live and breathe in your life right now. And he would go on, some of you say, well, what's the big deal with that? He says this in verse 25, he says it this way. He says, all this I've spoken while I'm still with you, But the advocate and the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. I'm sending an advocate to you. Advocate's not a word that we use a ton. And if we do, it's usually used in the phrase of like, I need someone to come and speak for me or speak on my behalf. Advocate is so much deeper. Advocate is someone who steps into my inadequacies and does something that I can't do. So like right now, I'm an advocate for my three-year-old son because he's just not capable of doing things he needs to do to take care of himself. Despite what he thinks, I can do more than him. And I advocate on his behalf. Do you see this? There's a, there's a reliance upon the advocate to accomplish something that you can't do on your own. Well, what does the advocate do? It says it this way. Put that scripture back up on the screen. It says this, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. How many? All things. Think about this. That the Spirit of God, it's talked about in the book of Isaiah, that you're going to hear a voice from behind and around leading and guiding you in the ways of God. And not only will he point you in the right direction to go, order my steps, what we just sang about, But also, he will remind you of everything that I've said to you. Jesus is saying, it's so good that I'm gone, because when I'm gone, the Spirit of God is going to live and breathe inside of you and remind you of everything that I've brought to you. The commands that I've brought to you, when the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, it's like they will be written upon your heart. Like you'll have them with you forever. What he's talking about here is a power. He's talking about... When I'm gone, the Spirit's going to come and give you the power to not just do the things I'm telling you to do, but to become the person I've called you to be. That I could do a work in you that you can't do on your own. That I could live and breathe. And it's not because you're not smart or you're not capable. You just don't have the power to do what Jesus is telling you to do. Because let's just be honest. Read about Jesus. Read what he tells you to do. Spend a little bit of time following him. Do you know how hard it is to keep the commands of Jesus? 
You know how hard it is? One person knows. Does anybody else know how hard it is to keep the commands of Jesus? It's hard. It's really hard. Uh, One of the commands that Jesus gives is in John 13. We didn't read about it last week, but he says it in here. He says, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. Pause. Some of you, when you were growing up in school, you heard the golden rule. You remember this? Do unto others. Okay, so none of you went to school. Great. (laughs) Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Thank you. Uh, Other people would say, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. Do you see the one-up that Jesus does here? No, no, no. Don't love them as you love yourself. You can't even love yourself right. Love them as I have loved you. Whoa. I heard a pastor say, this isn't the golden rule. This is the platinum rule. Like this is like one-upping everything. Love. How did Jesus love his disciples? Remember we talked about this. The one who was actively betraying him. Come sit next to me in the seat of honor. I want you to come sit at the table with me. The one who would deny him. Peter, I'm going to wash your feet and then I'm going to reinstate you even after you let me down. Doubting Thomas. You heard of Doubting Thomas before? Doubted so much that forever in history he'll be known as Doubting Thomas. Aren't you glad that you're not known in the annals of human history by your worst moment? Like there goes narcissistic Nick, right? Aren't you glad? I'm so glad for that. Thank you, Jesus. What does he say to Thomas? He says, come here, I know you were gonna doubt. Come put your hands on my wounds. Like, come feel them, I see. Do you know how hard it is to love your enemies? Do you know how hard it is to bless people who persecute you, the things Jesus is talking about? It's not because you're not smart to do it. It's just sometimes I feel like I don't have the power to do that. And what Jesus is saying, listen, it's good that I go because when I go, the spirit of truth, like the Holy Spirit, will fill you and give you the ability to do what you can't do on your own. Let me illustrate it to you this way. Yesterday morning, I showed up here at the church uh, to message prep and get ready for right now because I take this very seriously. So I showed up at 5.30 in the morning yesterday and I woke up and I got my coffee and come on, half the battle's just getting out of bed. And I got in the car And I drove over here and I had a great quiet time and I was ready to go and I get to the back door and as I'm standing at the back door, I go to get my key card and I left my key card to the building at home. I live about 15, 20 minutes away and in this moment, I'm filled with the spirit, okay? (laughs) It's a cussing spirit. It was a spirit that came up. I was not happy, pray for me. And I was sitting there and I'm realizing I got to get in my car and go all the way back home. By the time I get back home, my kids are definitely going to be up and I'm going to have to help. And see, this is where the thought process goes. (laughs) And as I'm standing there, I hear some shuffling and someone coming towards me. And I look over and it's Joey Hannon, our facilities manager of Heartland Church. Joey was here at five in the morning before I got here making sure that this place looked pristine and beautiful for Sunday morning. It looks beautiful on Sundays. You know that, right? When you come in and you see it. He was here prepping, and he just happened to walk out of a door, and he saw me, and he walks over and goes, hey, pastor, you you doing okay? You need anything? (laughs) Yeah, Joey, I left my key card at home. Can you let me in the building? And he, on his little key thing, pulls out his card, and he swipes it and lets me in the building and takes me back to my office and lets me in back there. Listen, It's not that I wasn't willing to come here and do it. Like I had all the desire, the willingness. I had set the coffee pot the night before. I was ready. Like I was, I just physically couldn't get through the door. Do you see this? I didn't have the ability to get through. I needed an advocate to come and let me through the door. And this is what the Holy Spirit does. There are going to be things that in your own understanding you cannot do You can't reason your way into this, no more knowledge. It's it's actually experiencing the Holy Spirit when he puts his power inside of you. And I promise you, if you try to do the things that Jesus tells you to do without the Holy Spirit, you will just get frustrated. That's why some of you left the church at a different stage in your life because you felt like I've got all these rules and I don't have the power to do any of them. Well, if that's you, you're not alone because the disciples were frustrated by the same thing. Doubting Thomas, who we talked about just a second ago, when Jesus says, I'm going somewhere, you can't follow me. Doubting Thomas or honest enough Thomas to ask the right question that everybody's thinking, right? He sits there and he says this. He says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. 
So how can we know the way? You're talking about going somewhere. I don't know where you're going. I can't even do what you're asking me to do when you're here in the room right now. Like 10 minutes ago, we were arguing over who was gonna be the greatest, and then you body slammed us by just washing our feet. Like how, how am I supposed to do this if you're gone? Can't you just show us the way? Can't you tell us the way to go somewhere? Which I think resonates with some of us because I love the idea of the Holy Spirit. Can't you just give me a book that I can read? And <laughs> can't you just point me to the TED Talk and show me how I can get the Holy Spirit and a quick little DIY YouTube video so I can like, sh just show me. How do I do it? And Jesus looks at him and responds, and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's not just something that you know about. It's something that you experience. This way that he's talking about, it's not going to be religious head knowledge. It's going to be a whole life understanding of the Spirit working in you. He's saying, listen, I know the way. And not only do I know it, I am the way. Take me by the hand and I'll show you the way to go. You see, there's a choice in this. Like right now, if you asked me, you said, Nick, how do I get down to Monument Circle downtown? I could tell you how to do it. I could draw you a map. I could say, hey, go down 69. You're gonna get off at 465. Actually, scrap that. Stay away from Benford. It's a disaster right now. <laughs> Don't even go near it. I could do all that. Or I could say, hey, get in the car. I'll show you. I'll show you how to get there. I'll take you. I'm not just going to leave you on your own, but I'm going to come with you and take you there. The decision that's on the table, and this is why I love Jesus. He doesn't force himself upon anybody. The decision is, are you going to get in the car when I open the door? Amen. Are you going to come with me? Amen. Are we going to go down there together? You see, there's a choice in what Jesus is saying. You're looking for the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life, which raises a choice for us that there's going to be a lot of different ways you could go. And there's going to be a lot of different truths that you can believe. And there's going to be a lot of different things you can do with your life. And I think for many of us, if we were honest, the reason why we don't experience the Holy Spirit, we want the Holy Spirit, this power that we're talking about, like that sounds so great. But the reason we never experience it is because if we did an audit of the narrative of my life, of how I make decisions, of how I see the world through my lens, I'm making decisions not out of his way, but it's my way. It's my way. It's my way. I'm going to do me. You heard that before? Somebody say it. I'm going to do me. Um, you notice that the people that say, I'm going to do me, like they never say that about a smart, rational choice when they make that. <laughs> never have I ever heard somebody say, you know what? I'm going to take a couple hundred extra bucks out of my paycheck and put it into my 401k. I'm going to do me. Like, no, you don't. <laughs> It's, I knew I shouldn't have done that, but I'm going to do me. Or, I know that's a bad idea, or that's indulgent, but I'm going I'm to do me. You see, all of us have a way that we go. Scripture says, all of us like sheep have gone astray. And can I be really clear? I think for many of us, this isn't like a willing, like a, like a conscious, like you don't wake up in the morning going, it's going to be my way today. I did it my, like, I don't think we, we wake up and we do it. I think it's very subconscious for a lot of us. Because we get on autopilot and we don't consider what does God want to do in my life today? Which way does he want to take me? So like, let me tell you how this shows up. This shows up when you're driving your car. You ever had a moment where you're driving your car and you're listening to worship music and somebody cuts you off? Or somebody's driving slow when you're trying to get to where you need to go real quick and a spirit takes over, all right? I had somebody a couple of months ago, they said, man, we really need some more of those H uh, bumper stickers for the back of our car. I said, no, you don't. Absolutely not. I don't want you driving around Fishers with your rage-filled spirit self. Listen, you can put the sticker on the car. You ain't filled with the spirit. All right. It's, it shows up. It's like autopilot. Like I don't want to, but it just shows up that way for me. And the danger in this is that if my life is on autopilot and I'm not considering the way or submitting my way to his way, I would actually don't have room for the Holy Spirit in my life because I'm just so set in my ways. Do you see this? I don't have room for it to work. For others, it's not just my way, it's my truth. It's not his truth, it's my truth. It's a phrase you hear a lot today, people that will say, well, this is my truth and what I see. And let me just be clear, that's not just irreligious and religious. It, it takes different expressions. This phrase of it's my truth, there's a subtle spirit of pride underneath it. Do you see it? 
that like I know everything, like I know the whole world and, and what I see and what I experience that as long as it makes sense to me, well, that's true. Let me tell you how that shows up in non-religious circles. It shows up as, well, I don't care. This is what I believe. And how it shows up within the church, which is just as sinister as this, is I know the truth of what the Bible says, but instead of having a soft heart about it, I latch onto that truth. I know what's right, you're wrong, and I use it as a weapon to beat people. You see what I'm saying? And the danger in both sides of the ditch on that is that if you fall into either one of those, the Holy Spirit can't work in my life because I don't have room for the Holy Spirit to speak to my truth and help me. Somebody asked me a question a couple months ago. It set me free from something. They said this, when was the last time God changed your mind about something? Changed your mind in how you saw someone or something? The answer of that's going to determine how pliable is my heart to the Holy Spirit. For some, it's not his life, it's my life. It's my life. And let me tell you how this shows up. Because again, I don't think this is conscious. I don't think a lot of people wake up going, well, it's my life. It's now or never. That's a Bon Jovi song. That's not, that, you, don't wake up, you don't wake up like that. I think a lot of people subconsciously would say, well, I've got my church life and I've got my work life and I've got my family life and I've got my social life and I got my social media life and I've got all these different things. And God would look at and say, you know, it doesn't work that way, right? Like, you know that, I heard somebody say, you have to let Jesus in the door, but when you let him in the door, he changes everything. Like, he redecorates the whole house. C.S. Lewis would say it this way. He'd say, God in his mercy kicks out the walls of the temples that we build for him, which is a nice poetic way of saying God doesn't fit in your box. He doesn't fit in the little box that we build for him of, well, you know what, God, you can speak to me about this, and that's good. You can have my whole life, but you can't have my finances. And you can't have my kids and you can't have my career or my job plan. No, those, like I love that you're a part of my life. I had somebody a couple weeks ago uh, or a couple months ago, I was talking with them and they said, man, I really want Jesus. Like I'm having a hard time feeling the presence of God. I really want him to be a part of my life. And I said, well, dude, that's the problem right there. They said, what do you mean? I said, he's not interested in being a part of your life. <laughs> he wants the whole thing. He wants every single part of it. And I wonder for some of us this is the reason why we can't experience the power, the, the power to become the people God has called us to be because we just don't have room for the Spirit. I'm so excited we get to talk about the Holy Spirit over the next couple weeks because in the coming weeks, we're going to talk more about what does the power of the Holy Spirit actually do in our lives. Today, I want to talk about getting ready for the Spirit to work. How do we make room for the Holy Spirit? Because for some of us, there's some housekeeping to do. You say, okay, I've got to uh, for some of you, you may be saying, how do I get the Holy Spirit? I want to take you to a passage of scripture and show you, as we start this thought process, how do we get our hearts set right and on the right goal? Because it was in one of the passages we read earlier. Did you see it? John, in John 14, uh, verse 16, it says, if you love me, keep my commands and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you. Now, quick test, depending on how you read this, it will determine how quickly the Holy Spirit can work in you. Because for some of you, because of your upbringing, the church you were raised in, the family you were raised in, maybe the image you have of who Christians are and who God is, when you read this, you read it this way. Tell me if this sounds familiar. If you love me, like if you really love me, you better keep my commands. You better do what I tell you to do. You better prove it that you love me. Because if you prove it, then I'll give you another who will be an advocate to help you, the spirit of truth. You better prove that you actually love me. And if you do, then you'll get what I have to give you. Do you see that? And if that's you, can I help set you free from something today? I want you to read this again, but read it through the lens of the Jesus that we see throughout the scripture, who when he sees the multitude of people, it says that he was brought to tears and his heart wept. He said, they're like sheep without a shepherd. When the sick were brought to him, and they said, are you willing to heal me? He said, I'm so willing to heal you. Little kids were drawn to him. Read it, read it through that lens. Read it this way. If you love me, like if you would just fall in love with me, if you would love me, then you will keep my commands. Like you'll do it. Like if, if you, you, you will keep my commands because I will put my spirit in you. Do you see the difference between the two? One says, prove it. And then I'll put my Holy Spirit in you and you can do the things that I'm telling you to do. The other says, make the goal falling in love with Jesus. 
Like make that the goal. Fall in love with Jesus and watch as behavior follows. The goal is not behavior modification. The goal is total self-transformation. That God, from the floor up to the top up, you can change every single part of my life. God, you work in me. God, put your spirit in me. Give me the power to do what you say to do. And watch as the more I fall in love with him, the more he starts to work in me. And I want to debunk something, because for some, when you hear fall in love, you're like, Nick, that sounds really churchy, and it sounds kind of poetic and weird and hard to do. Can I show you what it looks like to fall in love with Jesus? What does that actually look like? Married people in the room, you get this. Dating people in the room, you might get it someday. You think you get it now. You don't get it now. You know what real love is? Real love is not just something you talk about. You talk about it for a while, and it goes away. Real love is active, humble submission to the other person. It's humble submission to the other person. And let me show you what I mean by that. Right now, my wife and I, we are raising two little hellion little boys. I mean, just four and two, and we got another one coming in like 16 days. It's like the Thunderdome in my house every day. And I love them to death. But when we get to like 7.30 at night, come on, parents with little kids, you get it. You will go to sleep or I will put you to sleep. Like you have. <laughs> and you get done and you're tired. Yeah. Yes. And when I'm tired, I want to sit and I want to be quiet and I want to watch a show and I want to relax. And from my wife, you know what's loving to my wife? She wants to talk. <laughs> and here's what I've learned. We'll be married eight years. I'm just getting it now at year eight. <laughs> you know how I love my wife? I submit what I want to do for what she wants to do. And in turn, she submits what she wants to do for what I want to do. And there's this beautiful, no, the way I love you is I take my own self-interest and I lay it down to love you. Have you read scripture? Because the most famous verse of all time, for God so loved the world that he gave. Notice this, he gave. He submitted his son, who didn't want to, by the way. Can I be really clear? He did it, but what do he say in the Garden of Gethsemane? Please take this from me. I don't want to do this. But Father, not my will. What did he do? I submit to your will. I submit to it. All throughout scripture you see this. That true love is always expressed through submission. Of laying something down at the feet of God. Jesus, when he's asked, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. With everything that you are and then all your behavior of what you do to other people. Love those Love your neighbor as yourself. Take everything that you are and submit it unto God. I don't have time to show it to you today, but Jesus, when he's asked, or when he's talking to people, he says, are you burned out on religion? Like, are you tired? Are you tired of just trying harder and not getting it right? Really, what he's saying is, are you tired of trying to do this without the power that I can give you? Then take my yoke upon you. It's not a word we use a ton. Take, take a yoke. Oxen had a yoke over the top of them that would lead them and guide them and point them in the right direction. He's saying, listen, submit to this and watch. It says that my yoke is easy and my burden is light for you. Well, how is it easy and it's light? Because I'm actually pointing you in the way of life. Can I tell you this? True love is always expressed through submission in scripture. And you see time and time again, when people get it wrong, it's because they go, well, no, I'm, sub I'm not submitting to God. I'm not submitting to that. And the choice still remains the same. Do I want to be filled with the Spirit? And if it does, if I do, it starts with a humble, contrite heart that comes before God and says, God, I lay down my whole life to you, every single part of me. And today, as we start this, I, I want to get as practical as I can. Let me give you three really practical attitudes or submissions of a humble heart. Because listen, the shelf life of submission is about 24 hours. You know this? It's about 24 hours. I can submit in the morning, and by the time I wake up the next morning, God, I want to resubmit my life to you again. You can have every part of it. Let me go really practical. Three attitudes to adopt as we step into this series that we're talking through. And watch as the Holy Spirit starts to speak to you. The first is this, is that I'm going to submit myself to his way, not my way. I got a way I want to go. I know it. I have an autopilot that clicks on. I, gotta, I have a way that I want to respond when somebody is mean to me or when somebody's short to me or when the person behind the fast food counter seems like I'm an inconvenience to them. I have a way I want to show up. 
but God, I submit to your way. Your way is higher and better. Remember we talked about this when we were talking about ordering our finances, that God, he says it in Isaiah, he said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Like my ways are not your ways. They're actually higher and better. Can I take the mystery out of this? Submitting is simply an acknowledgement before God that goes like this. God, I know that you know, but I want you to know that I know. You feel like you're reading a Dr. Seuss book yet? God, I know that you know that I have my own way. And God, today, I don't want to just follow my way. I want to follow your way. So God, this morning, as I sit in your presence, I do this every day. My dad does this every morning. Kelly does this. My mom, we, we sit in the presence of God and we open our Bible and we say, God, before we even start Psalm 139, God, search me and know me. God, search my heart. Try me. See if there's any wicked way in me. Which I promise you, when you pray that before God, he doesn't have to search that far. He'll find it. Like, it's right there. Search me and know me and lead me in your way. Lead me in the way everlasting. Point me in the right direction to go. And can I tell you how this is going to practically play out for you? Because some of you are getting really excited. You're thinking, tomorrow morning I'm going to wake up and I'm going to say, God, help me live your way. And then tomorrow I'm going to just be like Jesus. And it's going to be awesome. Let me tell you how this plays out. In the morning I make the decision, God, I submit myself to your way. God, lead me in your way everlasting. And then like a sheep... I wander off the way throughout the day. And what you feel and what you notice is a still small voice. That's the Holy Spirit, by the way, going, hey, um, I think you're off the way. I think you're off the path. Hey, you know how harshly you just spoke to your wife? Hey, that's off the path. Hey, you know how you're being real short with your kids right now? Hey, that's off the path, brother. Come on, come, come back to the path. And there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus, true? So if there's no condemnation, when I hear the correcting voice of the Holy Spirit, I go, oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm going back to my old ways. God, I resubmit myself back to you, back to your ways. Show me how to live. If I don't do it right, I go make it right. God, you show me what to do. Lead me in your way. Help me to just not be on autopilot, but help me to consider your ways and what you want me to do. And what's amazing is over a period of time, watch as the Holy Spirit begins to just till the soil of your heart and slowly but surely you go, whoa, there are some rocks in there that I didn't even know were there. And don't be upset about the rocks. They're there because there's sin in your life. And the Holy Spirit's saying, I'm trying to take you to become somebody else. So Holy Spirit, I submit myself to you. God, you lead me. You guide me. I start with a submission to his way, which is essentially saying, God, I can't get through the door. I need somebody with a key card to let me through the door. You see this? And when I start that way, it leads me to my next submission, which is this, that God, I submit myself to your truth, not to my truth, but God, to your truth, I submit myself to you. I have a question that is worth pondering, considering, what is the basis of your truth? What's the basis of what you consider to be true or false? Is it you? Because I'm just telling you right now, if it's up to me, Whoa, I, I promise you, I am not smart enough to know what the truth is. I see the world through about this much of a lens right here. I need a bigger, greater source of truth than just myself. Is it my upbringing? Is it my background? Is it the political system I was raised in? What, what is my vantage point of truth? And I promise you this, if it's not in Christ Jesus, God, you inform my truth, It'll fall short time and time and time again because you only see a portion of the picture. This is why when Jesus, listen, this, here's the power and the value of this. Jesus, when he's talking to his disciples, you remember this, he says this, abide in me and abide in my word, like stay, remain, let my word, which to be clear, most of Jesus' responses, I don't know if you know this, are actually from the Old Testament. I hear people sometimes say, man, I'm all on board with Jesus, but that Old Testament God, same God. We're gonna talk about that next week. Today, tomorrow, yesterday, same God all the way through. Jesus was such a student of the word of God that he's regurgitating the word of God because it's just on his heart. Abide in my word, you are my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Truth has a ring to it, you know it, when it's actually true. And look at the power of what it has to do. To set who free? You free. Did you hear how quiet that was? Who is it set free? you free, not your parents, not your mom, not your spouse to set you free. And it's so important because, come on, we live in a world where even in the best of intentions, Christianity, people take the truth and they use it as a weapon to go bash non-believers for acting like non-believers. You see what I'm saying? 
He says, no, 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 don't get it twisted. The truth sets you free. You say free from what? Let me give you a couple. Free from yourself. Free from my past shortcomings and my failures. When I read scripture and I see God's truth and it says, listen, therefore there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. What he said earlier, PD, when he said earlier, he said that voice of the accuser that comes and tries to tell you you're not good enough, you take that truth of God and you go, whoa, hang on a sec. The Holy Spirit just reminded me that even if there is no power on he in heaven or in hell or below or beneath or anywhere that could separate me from the love of God, that is not truth, that's trash. This is truth, you see what I'm saying? It sets me free from myself. It sets me free from the opinions of others. Because the whole world's trying to tell you who you are, but there's a God in heaven that says, no, I know exactly who you are. I formed you in your mother's womb. I put you together. You're not an accident. You're not a mistake. I have your whole life planned out before you. I tell you, the truth sets me free from feeling the anxiety when people I love or people that I know don't believe the same thing that I believe. Because you know God gave people the freedom to choose whether they were going to come and receive him or not. And so when I encounter people that don't believe, do you, do you see what I'm saying, how this all works? That when I get near the truth, it sets me free from some things. It sets me free from patterns of sin that I don't even know that I'm committing. Y'all know you got blind spots, right? You know that? If you don't know you have a blind spot, congratulations, that's your blind spot. You have, you have blind spots. And your spouse probably sees them, but you don't see them. And Paul talks about this idea. He says, here's what submitting to the truth of God looks like. I take off my old self and I put on the new self every day. Jim Harrington, he's one of our covering pastors. He says it this way. I can't take off what I can't see. So part of getting in the truth is going, God, I know there's areas that I want to improve. And there are areas that you're interested in talking to me about that aren't even on my radar yet. So God, would you let your truth speak to me? God, I submit myself to your truth. I promise you, go sit in the presence of God tomorrow morning with your Bible and say, God, lead me in your truth and watch as you don't just read scripture, but scripture reads you. Watch it. Watch it happen. Because you see, when the door is opened, I submit not just my way and my truth, but it leads me to a point where I'm left with one decision of, no, God, I submit my whole life to you. My whole life. Every single quadrant of my life, God, you can have, it's yours. God, you take it. And there's someone here, I know it, when we talk about submission, it feels really scary because you go, man, submission, that feels like, well, what, that feels like there's a lot of risk. What if God is not good to me? What if there is no God? What if, can I promise you this? One, from just a logic standpoint, there's more, on the, more risk on the other side of that as just as there's on the other side. Because if I don't trust God with my life, then I got to trust me with my life. And how's that going for you? Can I trust God? Can I submit my whole life to him? Look what Jesus says in John chapter 10. He says this, and this is the same promise that's true for you and me today. He says this, I am the door. <laughs> come on, I open the door. Come on, the way to receive is to come through me. Anyone who enters through me will be saved. I came that they may have and enjoy life. And notice this, that they would have it in abundance, meaning to the full, till it, till it overflows. You know what he's talking about here? If you would submit your life to me, say, God, I'm going all in with you. You can have my whole life, every single part of it. Watch as God gives you a life worth living. Watch as you're filled, not just with what you think you need, but above and beyond, pressed down, shaken together, overflowing. You see what I'm saying? Do you get that picture of overflowing? I hope you don't miss this. My favorite Psalm right now, Psalm 23, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. You know what that means? When it's at the brim just tipping over, God, I can't believe it could get any better than this. Oh yeah, watch this. God, I can't, I can't believe it. I'm seeing how you're working in my family and you're working in my finances because I've ordered them your way. And I see how you're working in my workplace and I see how you're just giving me opportunity that I couldn't have. Could it get any better than this? Yeah, watch this. God, I can't, I can't even believe it. Yeah, watch me do more than you could ever imagine. Come on, my burden is easy. Friends, let me encourage you this morning. There's a God that knows you that says, come on, I've anointed your head with oil. The fact that you're here today, I want you to think about this. God has ordered your steps to bring you to this moment. It's not an accident or a coincidence. He chose you. And he says, and look, your cup can overflow. Come into relationship with me. 
Start every day. God, I submit myself to you again. And watch as the Holy Spirit opens the door for God to begin to work in your life. I want to pray for any person in this room that would say, man, I feel so far from God and distant. And if he would want me and come into my life, I'd want him to. Let me pray for you. Father, God, I thank you for every person under the sound of my voice. God, I thank you for your life. God, I thank you that you came to give life and life to the full. And God, I pray that for my brothers and sisters right now, God, that we would experience you in a mighty and powerful way. I want to speak to anybody this today that would say, Nick, I feel so far from God, but I know that I need him. If that's you, I want to lead you in a prayer right now. God's waiting. He's saying, here, I'm at the door. I want to open it for you. You just have to ask him to come into your life. So if that's you, say this prayer with me in the quietness of your heart, just in your seat. Say this. Say, Jesus, I know I need you. I'm sorry for doing things my own way, for following my own truth, for holding on to my life. But I thank you for dying for me so that I could have new life in you. God, today I give you my life. Say this next part. Say this. Say, change me, God. Help me to see you as working. I give you my life. Father, God, I thank you for every person that just prayed that prayer. God, I thank you for new life in you. And I pray right now that they would experience you like never before. God, would you work in a mighty and powerful way. God, show yourself faithful in their life. We love you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, can we congratulate everybody that made that decision? We're so proud of you. Hey, look at me real quick. If you prayed that prayer with me just a second ago right there, come on, we believe that you're starting a relationship with Jesus right now, and it's just the first step. And I would love to help you take your next step on that spiritual journey. If that's you and you said, Nick, today I believed, I prayed that prayer with you. I don't need you to get up or come to the front or raise your hand. I just want you to text the letter B to 68,000. It's our short code. B for I'm believing today. And I'd love to reach out to you and help you take a next step help you figure out what does my next step actually look like and where do I go and what does God have for me? Everybody can text one letter, right? Text that letter right now and we'll get back to you really quick. And if you're considering, you showed up here and you're like, I don't, I don't know, but if it could be, I, I, I wanna pray for you specifically. And I wanna send you a book that my dad, Pastor Darren, wrote all about beginning a new relationship with Jesus. If that's you, just text the letter C to 68,000 and we'll pray for you and we'll send you that book as well today too. But church, we love you. We're so grateful for you. What a privilege. I pray this week that as you leave here, Lord, bless you. He would keep you. He'd cause his face to shine upon you and that he'd give you peace. I hope you have the best week ever. Come back next week. We're going to talk more about the Holy Spirit. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you.